chapter 5. And, you know, we spent a great deal of time last week in a deeper understanding of the wisdom of God and the wisdom of, of uh, Deuteronomy. And I get very passionate about the book of Deuteronomy uh, for a lot of reasons. First of all, it's the one that Yeshua quoted three times when he was in the desert. Second of all, it becomes the foundation, the cornerstone of Judaism in our understanding of the declarations and proclamations of God. It contains within it the blessings and the curses. It contains in it with the instruction that was not the instruction for those at Sinai. It was the instruction for us. Now, the sermon that we're just now deeply getting into that Moses is providing, he's delivering passionately to the children of Israel that were not at Sinai. This is the generation that he's preparing to enter the promised land, he's equipping them. He's filling their pockets. And if you just see him filling their pockets, stuffing their pockets full of wisdom and understanding and a reminder of the teaching and the things that will equip them. It's like the Boy Scouts when they pack a, a backpack and they have these items which are essential survival items. This is a, what you need if you're going to be in the wilderness, what you're going to need to survive. You make sure you pack this and make sure you pack that and make sure you take this with you and don't leave this out. And make sure you have a flashlight and you have a flashlight battery and you have enough flint and you have enough matches and you have something to keep them dry and all these things. This is that be prepared message. This is that be prepared sermon that Moses is giving to these children of Israel because he's not going to be there. And like a father that gives the last and dying, dying wish instruction to a son, son, listen, take care of things for dad. I want you to make sure, don't forget to do this. Don't forget to do that. I want to remind you of this. And over and over again, he's giving them instruction, the same instruction that their fathers and their mothers heard at Sinai. He's repeating for them because they did not bear witness to it. And as we get into chapter 5, we now hear these words which are so profound in the Hebrew, Shema. Now we talk about the Shema. The, the Shema is a proper name given to a particular hero O Israel, Shema Yisrael. But it's not the only Shema. Okay? If that were the only Shema that was in the Bible, then the word Shema would not be used but one time. God uses the word here, Shema, over and over and over again through the Bible because it's not just the hear like we think about hearing. See, if you go get a hearing test, they send a little sound in your ear and you raise your hand, right, if you hear that sound. What do you understand about that sound? The only thing you understand about that sound is if you heard it or not. That's it. You don't know the decibel level. You don't know what the sound generator was. You have no idea what it means. I've had those hearing tests, and I wonder, should I have heard it? Oh, does that mean that I'm hard of hearing? Oh, does that mean that I've lost frequency? Oh, does that mean that my hearing's gone? Oh, does that mean if I didn't raise my hand, it's been a long time since I heard a sound? Oh, my goodness, did I miss a sound? All right? What's going on? Am I going to need hearing aids? Are they going to come out here and tell me, this is what you're thinking the whole time you're going through these tests, right? Okay. Wow, that was a long time. Was I supposed to hear something? Uh, excuse me, was I supposed to have heard something? Right? You've been to those hearing Am I gone? Well, I don't know what happens. It's only me. And I'm sitting down. But Shema doesn't just mean hear. Shema in the Hebrew is, it's kind of like uh, when I teach you about Shabbat and tell you that Shabbat, the only action of Shabbat is rest. And that's a passive action, right? Right? Well, but it has to be married to another passive action, which is receive. In order to rest, you have to receive rest. In order to do it, you, that's, that's the whole passive action of Shabbat. You can't not receive and get rest. You can't receive Shabbat and not be rested and refreshed. It, they go hand in hand. It's, 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 the, most pa it's the most active passive behavior you can have, and that is to receive and rest. It's not that you're not doing anything, you're doing something very intentional, and that is receiving from the Lord. And so when you're to do no regular work on Shabbat, you're supposed to do the work of God on Shabbat, which is rest. When you are in this Shema, this here, 
This is the kind of here that your wife, husbands, I'm going to talk to you now. This is the kind of here that your wife wants you to hear. She wants you to shema. She wants you to hear and listen and understand and weigh and digest and take it into you and have there be a metabolic transformation in your being by the very hearing of those words. Now, 90% of you have no idea what I'm talking about. (laughs) But I'm going to talk to the men again. This is the most romantic thing you can do for your wife is Shema. And ladies, if your husband were doing more shemaing, they'd be getting a little bit more schmoozing and a little bit more <laughs> schmooching, and, right? Yep. Amen? Come on, this is where you amen. This goes on the tape. This is where, where the people that listen to this or my colleagues who may listen to this go, well, you sure lost them on that one. No, this is where I got you on this one. So in chapter 5, we hear this declaration. Moses summoned all the Israelites and said to them, Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the laws and rules that I proclaim to you this day. Study them and observe them faithfully. Now understand this in the New Covenant. It says faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by Shema. Hearing and hearing the Word of God. And we have to understand that this is an active, involved, engaged, focused, intentional hearing long beyond the concept that we have, did you hear me? Yeah, I heard you. No, did you hear me? Did you understand me? Did you weigh into it? Did you perceive it? Did you feel it? Did you understand it? And are you going to apply it? This is the kind of Shema that is so powerful. It is so active. It's transforming. This is the kind of listening that God wants us to do to His Word and the kind of listening that our wives want us to do to them. They want us to shema in a way that it changes us. And Moses was compelling. This is a compelling. When he says shema, it's like taking your child and grabbing their face and saying, look at me, shema. I want to speak right into your spirit. I want this to become the very fabric of you. I want your blood cells to change by the hearing of these words. This is kind of what we want to do when we do healing services and we speak right to a cancer tumor. We tell that cancer, listen to me. Shema, you hear me, tumor. You leave this body now. That's total authority when you have someone who's Shema. And you're completely engaged. You're completely involved. You're not distracted. You're as focused and as, as direct as you can be. And these words of God are chosen so Because he doesn't say, listen to me, pay attention to me. He says, Shema. Hear, O Israel. Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel. There's a declaration from the very words of God, from the mouth of God. I want you to hear it, obey it, apply it, live it, breathe it, make it a fabric of you. It says if you ate meat, if you ate food, if you drank water, it, it comes and I want it to permeate your entire body. This is the kind of listening It has to be applied. It has to be practical. And remember, he's talking to millions of people. Imagine the quiet, just like this quiet, as you focus, as you weigh in, and as you enter in, and as you lean in. This is that kind of Shema that he is proclaiming. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. We talked about Brit, the covenant, the cut, how important the covenants were. Why this covenant, the Sinai covenant, this Mosaic covenant was so profound and so powerful and is not something that requires our obedience in order to receive salvation. It does require our understanding in order to relate to one another. So this isn't compelling us to become what they quote-unquote Torah observant. This is compelling us to be God observant, biblically observant, biblically understanding, wise in the counsel of God. And so here's what he's telling them. 
The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. Isn't that interesting that he's now including this generation as the us? We've already declared and uh, we've understood and established the fact that this generation was not at Sinai. They did not hear the words at Sinai, but the covenant applied to them. And therefore, it was inclusive and it was contemporary and it was for today. And he clarifies that for you. It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, the living, every one of us who is here today. Why? Because God's covenant is with the living, it is not with the dead. And therefore, if you are here today and you are alive, this covenant is with you. And these instructions are for you. Are you not these people, every one of us who is here today, who is within the hearing of my voice, who is Shema? Hear, O congregation Bethel. Because this is for us who are living today, because the Word of God is living. Wasn't it clearly established when he said, You pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? He's the God of the living, not of the dead. This is the living Word of God and applies to us who are here in the hearing of this Word. If you can shema, if you can hear, this Word's for you. It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, the living, every one of us who is here today. And this is the contemporary today, meaning today. I have Wayne when he reads the word today. And these commandments that I give you today are going to be on your heart because we want to punch today for you to understand that, oh, that means now, that means today. It doesn't mean then because it would have said yesterday. It means today, and Deuteronomy is contemporary in the fact that it means today. Face to face the Lord spoke to you on the mountain out of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to convey the Lord's words to you, for you were afraid of the fire and did not go up to the mountain, saying, uh, I, the Lord, let me see, uh, yeah, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage, you shall have no other gods before me. He's restating the Ten Commandments. Why? I asked this question on our Tuesday night class. I'll ask this of you. Maybe I've asked it to you last week or before. How many of you were raised to believe in the Ten Commandments? Get those hands up really high. Okay. Isn't that interesting? That fascinated me. And how many of you were raised on the Sabbath? Isn't that funny? Don't you find that quite odd? Like three or four or five hands went up. All the hands went up about the Ten Commandments. But only three or four or five hands went up to honor the Sabbath. And yet God states and He restates and He restates that all of these, and these are the essentials. What happens? It's time for us to return to the ancient path. Jeremiah says, when you come to the crossroads, return to the ancient path, and there you will find your shalom. This is what we're doing. Yes, Nadine. Hold on one second. You need a microphone. Raise your hand high, Nadine, so Tim can see you. There you go. Thank you. Um, I was raised to think that Sunday was the Sabbath, and I know ah. now it's not true, ah. but we kept the Sabbath on Sunday. Just wanted to make that comment. Conrad, is that what you were to? Here you go. Can we get a microphone over here to Conrad? Conrad's a pastor. Many of you have heard me refer to Conrad before, but uh, I like to use Conrad because he's, uh, he is an ordained pastor who's raised up, raised up denominationally and within uh, basically, you know, functional denominational Christianity with, uh, with traditional uh, seminary teaching. We weren't even allowed to wash the car on Sunday. Now, we weren't taught it was the Sabbath, but we were taught it was the Sabbath. Right. We never heard it from the pulpit, per se. But we all knew 
that you did no work. And so we were taught that it got changed, and we know why it got changed, or why we, you know. And so it was really precarious, and I kept on saying, huh? You know, so yeah, that's what we were taught, and that's what is taught in seminaries. Yes. We won't talk about what seminaries, Southern Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal, right. but that's what's being taught. Right. And so when you take a look at the inerrant Word of God, how many of you were taught that in Timothy it says that the, all Scripture is God-breathed? Okay, yeah, and that it's inerrant. Well, except for that part. <laughs> and that you're not supposed to add to or change, right? Anybody taught that? Well, except for that part. Isn't that interesting that the quote-unquote Jewish parts of the Bible, the Passover and Easter, the Sabbath day, and even the multiplicity of God were altered based on an anti-Semitic theology attributed to a single person that began this process in 325 A.D. His name was Constantine. Yes. Uh, I was wanting to ask, what do you say to someone when you're trying to tell them that you are learning that God never changed the Sabbath and they refer to the scripture in Acts where Paul met with some of the disciples on Saturday night that went into Sunday and that changed it. You know, that was it. Oh, because he met with them? Yeah. On yeah, I met, somebody on, I met somebody on Tuesday at 4 o'clock. Uh, yeah, I understand, but what I'm asking you is what, what do you say to somebody when they say that to you? Well, I don't argue opinion with anybody. You don't? No, I never argue opinion. Why would you argue opinion? You well, have I, the Word I of God. Don't. Tell me in the Scriptures. Show me in the Scriptures. If this, a person wants to quote you out of Acts, yeah. that's great. Praise God that they know the Bible. Okay, now show me in the Bible where it clearly says, okay, that in six days the Lord created the seventh, and, 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 and so does he attribute that on the first day of the week? So what day does he call Yeshua's ascension or his resurrection? What day of the week is that? The Bible tells you that's the first day of the week. So that wasn't Sunday. That must have been Monday. According to your friend, that's now been changed to Monday. Right? According to his logic. Well, then the timeline of the Bible doesn't work, does it? Okay? Then all the timeline has to shift, if that's the case. And everything has to move and moved up. And he didn't come in on the 10th of Nisan. He came in on the 11th, and that has no meaning meaning whatsoever. And he wasn't crucified on the 14th when the lambs were. He was crucified on the 15th, and he rose on the 18th because everything has to move because of your friend. And I, I think that that's powerful. Are they right? Okay, well, why would you want to argue that? Okay. You know, I wouldn't argue it. I would say I that's just, great. So, yeah. so here's what I want you to do, okay? Where did they go to church? Baptist. <laughs> okay, so the, then they need to go to the Baptist denominations and change Easter Sunday to Easter Monday. And if they can do that, based on their argument, then I'd say God bless them. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> but you make it so clear for me. You know? I, I, don't enter, I don't entertain those discussions. I, I come with an open book and say, show me in the Bible where it was changed. Okay. Oh, you're saying it was implied. Well, the same, God doesn't imply. God implies nothing. Okay, if God picks the color of thread, he wants for a garment. All right, if he tells you the color and how to derive the color, if he tells you how to make it and he wants it blue and he tells you the kind of blue, then I think he can tell you what day something falls on. All right, Roland, you had your hand up? Hold on a second until you get a microphone. Hold on uh, one second, you've got to turn the microphone on. Are you with me? Are we with me? Okay. Yeah, there was also a reference about uh, Yeshua rising on uh, the first day of the week, which was the Sabbath, was one of the references that a lot of people use. I understand that um, uh, Constantine had changed the Sabbath because Saturn was the chief god that he worshipped, and as he included uh, Christianity in his worship, it was more convenient to worship on the first day of the week. And that goes back to some uh, Roman emperor type stuff. But for those of you that maybe did not grow up in Alabama, we had uh, the blue laws, which required you to close your business 
on, uh, on the first day of the week or on Sunday. So it was that ingrained in the uh, teaching around here. You know, in this debate that's been going on for uh, since 300, three, since 326, when 325, 326, when Constantine issued these three decrees of the doctrine of the Trinity, the changing of the Sabbath day to Sunday, and the resetting of Passover to be celebrated uh, on Easter, uh, and combining them and only making it a one day, uh, thereby celebrating only the resurrection as opposed to the life and the death and the resurrection, which is a complete Passover picture. Uh, he changed it based on an anti-Semitic theology, and in fact, in his writings and in his letters said, we will remove all things Jewish. And so this was the foundation. This was a cornerstone. Uh, and so when you wonder how did we get so far astray from the Word of God, this is what happened, and so it became man's doctrine. So, it, you know, in a congregation like this where we, we establish that the Word of God is going to rule, and regardless of what man thinks, God, let all men be liars. This is what the Word says. Let all men be liars. Let God be true. We're going to stand on the Word of God. One of the reasons he was anti-Semitic was because he, the people were supposed to worship him as a God also. Correct. And the stubborn Jews, thank God, did not see it that way. So being stubborn does have its uh, consequences and also its rewards. We bow down to no man. No man. It's uh, historical, and it made Constantine hysterical. All right, let's get back into, uh, was there another question? One more. Was there a hand that was up? Just, uh, Joyce, um, I get that question a lot about uh, uh, why they waited till the afternoon, and that's because they were good Jews, and they were too busy honoring the Sabbath. Correct. Sabbath is a Sabbath is a Sabbath is a Sabbath is a Sabbath. Whether you were taught it or not, the Word of God supports it. You got a question here? Raise your hand. Hi. Okay, there you go. Let the usher see where you are. That's how it works. In tracing the uh, Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, I went into the New Testament, and every one of them is actually written in the New Testament. Of course it is. But... Remember the Sabbath day, but it's covered under John fourteen fifteen. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Correct. The first three, it says you, you, you. But when you get to the fourth commandment. Okay, well, let me ask you, do you have a question? Yes. The okay. question is, is remember the Sabbath day a direct command to man at that point? And rather, because all the others have you in the beginning. You shall have no other God's before me, you, you. And then the fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day mm -hmm. and keep it holy. So to all mankind. To all mankind. So that was a direct command. You have to read, to you have to read the, the Sabbath day is to be celebrated by you. You is understood. Is that your manservant, your maidservant, your animals, your, this is, this is all mankind okay. is to remember the Sabbath. The alien living among you, your, your cattle, your livestock, everything is supposed to take a Shabbat. In fact, it applies to the land. The land is supposed to get a Shabbat. There's a Shabbat year. There's a Jubilee year. If you take a look at the entire concept of Shabbat, Shabbat is a universal concept. For six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he ceased from work and rested and was refreshed. The land ceases from work and rests. The people cease from work and rest. This is a whole refreshment kind of thing. The land has a Sabbath year where there's an entire year where you don't harvest and you don't plant. And you glean enough and you, you harvest enough in the sixth year to last you the seventh year, plant it the eighth year, and harvest it in the ninth year. Okay? God has this perfect plan, and if we understand it, we too will reap those same benefits where we will bear that kind of harvest in our life. Yes, it is very clear that it doesn't say you. It is an, a universal is a universal reference. Shabbat is an understanding. It's an island in time. It's why it has no evening and it has no morning. It is an entity. Shabbat is a, it's, it's a, it's, it's like defining a Jewish person as a bloodline. Is it an ethnicity? Is it a, a lifestyle? Is it a, a genealogy? It's everything. Shabbat is everything. It is an entity. And because it is an entity, it is to be observed as an entity. All right, so I, the Lord, am your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods beside me. 
So who are you to pray to? God. Period. You're not to pray to the Son. You're not to pray to the Mother. You're not to pray to any man. You are to pray through. He said, whatever you ask for in my name. He said, when you pray, pray our Father. Praying to Yeshua is not instructed in the Bible. There will be no other gods before me. Why? Because in the end, everything will be subject to the Father, including the Son. Everything will be subject to the Father, including the Son. Therefore, all prayers are to be directed to God through Yeshua in His name. This is the pattern God gives us, and this is the pattern He wants. Why? No one comes to the Father but through the Son. Understand the terminology and the vernacular. Why? Because there's only one God. The declaration of one God. Yes, the word is echad in the Hebrew. Echad, a compound unity. Yes, made up of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Wonderful Counselor, Guardian, Healer, uh, every entity you can possibly imagine wrapped into one singular being who has a compound unity, like a bunch of grapes. Not one grape, but a bunch of grapes, a singular bunch has multiple items, multiple parts to it, but it's still one bunch, one team, one family, one house has many rooms. This concept of God is so compound, but it is unified, it is unity, it is echad. Nowhere in Scripture is God referred to as a singular. He's always referred to as a plural one. A plural one. But didn't David pray to Jesus when he said, my Lord, or Lord of my Lords? No, he said, he said uh, my Lord is sitting at, the Lord said to my Lord, sitting at my right hand. Isn't that what he said? He, uh, there was another, I can't tell you exactly where it is, but it well, says Lord of me, my yeah, Lords. I, okay. Am I, what's going on here? I'm, I'm, let, let, let them. Uh, unless, uh, but the point of the Bible is, is that it's God's plan, okay? that, that there be no other gods before me. Okay? God incarnate, okay? he was all man and all God. Okay? Nowhere is there instruction to pray to Jesus. Is there any instruction that you're aware of? Psalm, right, Psalm 110, verse 1, that's what he's saying. The Lord said to my Lord, sitting in my right hand. So he was talking about the, if the, uh, um, the father and son relationship, or, or uh, but the point of this discussion is, is that it's about the father, and that in the end, everything is subject to the father, even the son. So you shall have no other gods beside me. This is refuting, uh, this is a, the establishment of monotheism. This is the establishment of the uh, genealogy of the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. This all leads into this declaration that has become the watchword of Israel. And so in this declaration of the watchword of Israel, it's a confirmation of the first commandment. Now, when Yeshua was asked, what is the greatest commandment, what did he say? Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Achad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And the second is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. The one God concept is so essential. Why? Because Abraham, Abram was set apart from a family of idol worshipers. Not only were they idol worshipers, they were idol makers. And because he heard the call of God to be set apart, because he answered that call and believed in one God, 
the establishment of Yehudi, Yehudim, Jewish. Yehudi, the, or the word Jew, worshiper of God. Worshipper of God, not God's worshipper of God. The Yehudim, the Jewish people, were the worshipers of God. They were set apart people because they believed in one God. And his instructions were very clear. You're going to head down this path to one God and one God only. You're not going to have multiple gods. You're not going to have wooden statues. (coughs) You're not going to pray to members of God's family. One God. Clearly establish one God. Not the mother not the son, not the brothers and sisters, not the, not the relatives. One God. You're going to pray to God. And you can pray in this name. But that's going to clearly establish this. You shall not make for yourself a sculptured image, any likeness of what is in the heavens above or on the earth below or on the waters below the earth. Now there are denominations which embrace sculptures and attribute spiritual value and the praying to and the lifting up the name of to saints and to people who were in heaven or believed to be of heaven. But the Hebrew says, you shall not make for yourself a sculptured image, any likeness of what is in the heavens above or on the earth below or on the waters below the earth. You should not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am an impassioned God, visiting the guilt of the parents upon the children, upon the third and upon the fourth generations of those who reject me, but showing kindness to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The nature of God revealed in His Word. If you heard me preach on the nature of God then you know that everything was done to reveal God's true nature, which was a loving God, which was a passionate God, a compassionate God, to reveal the true nature of God. And here is the true nature of God. If you do these things, you break my command. Breaking my command is sin. And if there's going to be sin in your life, and in this particular sin, I'm going to tell you the consequence of that sin. Not only are you separated from me, but you bring a curse on your children. When he gives us the instruction in Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9, he tells us to talk about these things and teach them to our children. Why? So that they don't perpetuate the curse, that they can be broken. So acceptance in Messiah Yeshua cannot, cannot break this curse, a generational curse, unless you stop this behavior. Does this make sense to you? Oh, can generational curses be broken? Yes, through the shed blood of Messiah Yeshua. But if you continue down a path of worshiping an idol, your generational curse cannot be broken because you're opposed to yourself. You're a double-minded person. You're unstable in everything you do. It's contrary to the Word of God to pray to an idol of any kind. Well-intentioned, not well-intentioned, celebrating the life and the birth and the holiness of anyone whoever walked the face of this earth, regardless of how great they were, what contribution they made to mankind, God prohibits it. This is a prohibition of God. This is not something that says, well, if they were worth it, if they should be memorialized. In God's economy, everybody should be memorialized. Everybody should be lifted up and encouraged and respected and treated well. But if we elevate one person above another, then we have a man-made hierarchy that refutes the Word of God. God has clearly established higher than all else. No one can obtain the height and the depth and the breadth. Who else can give life? And when we look at the exalting of a person, place, or thing above God, can that person, place, or thing create life? They cannot. They can carry life, but they cannot create it. They cannot create the cells. They cannot pick up the dust of the earth. Now, Yeshua was able to create an eye for a blind man. How did he do it? He picked up dirt from the earth. 
He spit into that dirt and he replaced that eye. Why? Because it was clearly demonstrating that he was all man and all God. Only God himself can create life. Raise those hands high. The ushers can't see you. I can see you, but the ushers, the ushers have to see you. They have to get you the... the uh... Yes. This is where we get sins of the fathers. Right? Sins of the fathers. What about the sins of the fathers? Is this where it starts? I mean, is this... This is the generational curse, yes. This is where he says that, that uh, for I, the Lord God, and an impassioned God, visiting the guilt of the parents upon the children, upon the third and upon the fourth generations of those who reject me. How do you reject him? You reject him by breaking his commands. His rejection is clear. It's not reje rejection because you deny. I got lots of hands. You're going to have to hold those hands high and just wait. Okay? Excuse me. Let me answer this question. You reject God not by denying the Messiahship of Yeshua. That's one way. You reject God when you break His commands, when you do it your own way. Partial obedience is complete disobedience in God's economy. Partial compliance. Nine out of ten is not a passing grade in God's economy. And I'm going to tell you, whoever sold you that bill of goods that said to you, oh yeah, the one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten, yeah, those are good, but we can change this one at our will. They sold you a bit of bill of goods. Because on the day of accounting, when you say, when God says to you, well, wait a second. Understand, Yeshua told you that these days were coming when He was going to say, depart from me, I don't know you. Oh, but we did these things in your name. Yeah, 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 yeah. But what you did the least to these people, the least to my brothers, you did to me. How did you do it to them? Well, you changed the Word of God. You changed the way things were done. You changed, you added to, you altered, and you persecuted because they didn't change it your way. They held on to their way because this was my way, and yet you rejected them and you persecuted them and you condemned them and you killed them and you criticized them. But this tells you right here, visiting the guilt of the parents upon the children upon the third and upon the fourth generation of those who reject me but showing kindness to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments so it's the word of god today are still suffering still suffering from because the of this you can plead the blood fathers. you can plead the blood of messiah over generational curses and say okay i plead the blood of messiah but if you continue in this behavior you're perpetuating the sin you're not breaking it you're repeating it. And it's clear, and there's great confusion about this. If you want to be delivered by different generational curses, stop doing the same things that the parents did and stop following the same teaching and go back to the Word of God. This isn't an easy teaching. You know, Yeshua told the disciples, He told them many these things are a hard teaching. They refute everything you know and everything you understand. But that does not make them false, it makes them true. And because they're difficult, but what about all these places that teach this? Well, what about them? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. It's not easy to be set apart. You're going to take rejection. You're going to take scorn. You're going to take uh, a lot of criticism, a lot of heat from your friends because they say, well, what, are you becoming Jewish? As if that were a bad thing, Bo, by the way. <laughs> okay, hold on one second. I've got others. You just wait. Okay, you got one back here? Virginia? <clears throat> I was just wondering, uh, when I went to Israel the first time, and when my mother went, we brought back things carved out of olive skin, like the David of him holding the lamb. I have one that I bought of the, crown, the, of the head of Christ with the crown. Is that idolatry? You tell me. I don't know. I don't pray to it. Well, there you go. It, to me, it is a reminder there you go. The Just like a mezuzah is a reminder. See, what people do is remember there are people who are today praying to, praying to other gods. You say, oh, how can you say that? Well, go do the research yourself. You figure out who it is. Praying to other gods. Praying to men and to women. You figure it out. You tell me whether or not it meets or not. 
You make the call. I'm not here to teach you against other religions or teach you theology. I'm here to teach you the Word of God. What you do when you go home and you study this and you look at the facts in evidence around the world today, you tell me whether or not people today are praying to idols. You make that decision. I'm not going to make that decision for you. I have my own opinion. You have to draw your own conclusion. I declare as for me in my house, my prayers are to the God of God. How do I open my prayer? God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I come to you in the name of Yeshua. I declare who I'm praying to and who I'm praying through. So as for me and my house, this is what we do. What you do is up to you. That's your relationship with God. I cannot manage your relationship with God. I can only tell you clearly what the Word of God says. Yes, Joyce. Well, I feel like that this sort of uh, tells you what we need to do right here. It's in Second Peter. But Joyce, I have to limit to a question. What's your question? Oh, I can't read the scripture then. <laughs> Just, but, but, but as we move through, if you have a question, let me, let me get to the question, but let me, let me move okay, on. Okay, I, I just really wanted to read the scripture. Okay, quickly. Okay, it says, yes, we have the prophetic word made very certain. You will do well to pay attention to it to, as a light shining in, the dark, in a dark, murky place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in the heavens. First of all, understand that no prophecy of Scripture is to be interpreted by an individual on his own. For never has a prophecy come as a result of human willing. On the contrary, people moved by the Ruach HaKodesh as he spoke the message from God. It says it all over. Messiah Yeshua said himself in Matthew 5, 17, I did not come to abolish the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill them, not until everything that must happen has happened, not the least stroke of the pen shall disappear from the law. And anyone who teaches against this and teaches others not to do this will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever teaches this word and obeys this word will be considered great in the kingdom of heaven. It's pretty clear, isn't it? That nothing is to disappear from the law or the prophets. Now, is this the path to salvation? No. The path to salvation is only through faith in Messiah Yeshua. But you want quality of life. How many of you want quality of life? Everybody here wants quality of life. God gives you the path for quality of life. This is the path for quality of life. I asked the question on Tuesday, how many of you as you age and get older say, I don't want anybody to feed me when I get older. I want to be self-sufficient until the day I die. How many of you say that? Okay. Then why do you let the pulpit feed you? God, this is for your instruction, for your betterment. Don't let other people feed you things that aren't true. That's why you're here in this place, because I'm not here to refute what other people tell you. I'm here to tell you what the Word of God says, and it is unchangeable. If it were changeable, it wouldn't be God, would it? It's not the shifting sand. It's not the way the wind blows this way and that way based on one man's doctrine and one man's theology. It's either all true or it's all a lie. And if it's all true, then it's all true. He says, you shall not swear falsely by the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not clear one who swears falsely by his name. You know, I get that all the time. I tells me they're an atheist. I say, you're an atheist. You swear to God? They go, oh, yeah, I'm an atheist. I swear to God. <laughs> it's one of my favorite little traps. There's a discussion about it with an atheist and a, uh, and a uh, Messianic Jew. And uh, the uh, Messianic Jew said to the atheist, now let me ask you a question. Which God don't you believe in? Do you not believe in the God that the Orthodox believe in or you don't believe in the God that the Messianic Jews believe in? See, he was trying to pin him down to which God he doesn't believe in. It's a great argument for a... Uh, for an atheist. So which God are you telling me you don't believe in? It's very hard. Being an atheist is one of the hardest theologies there is 
because you have to defend all of it. You have to have an answer for all of it. And when you come across the argument that God didn't do this or they can't tell you how it happened if it wasn't God, usually they get angry. So that's when I tell them. So you're an atheist? You swear to God? Right, I'm an atheist. All right. Deuteronomy 5.12, observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your ox or your ass or any of your cattle or the stranger in your settlements, so that your male and female slave may rest as you do. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God freed you from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Somebody finish the statement, if you want to, if you feel like it, unless somebody teaches you differently. Unless somebody with power and authority like a Roman emperor, emperor declares that if you don't do this, you'll die. Or if you do this, you'll die. I believe that Scripture tells us we must be willing to count the cost. Mordecai was willing to count the cost, wasn't he? Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were willing to count the cost, weren't they? Why does God tell us these things if we're not willing to prepare ourselves because of this gift of salvation? This is your salvation. What value do you put? Oh, you say it's priceless, but are you willing to give your life for it? Tens of millions of Jewish people have given their life. In the history of mankind for being Jewish, for defying Roman rule, for defying the Ottoman Empire, for defying Spanish rule, and all those that would try to convert or die. Many converted. South America is filled with conversos, people that were forced to convert. Africa is filled with conversos, forced to convert. And some pockets in uh, the Beit Manasseh in, in India, and the Beta Israel in Ethiopia. And now they're finding that in secluded parts of South America, there are observant Jewish people speaking Hebrew in a nation that there is no Hebrew, where a dialect, a guttural dialect of Spanish is, is spoken, <coughs> excuse me, but yet they're speaking Hebrew and they're praying in Hebrew and they have a Torah and they're reading from the scrolls. And there's no logical explanation for it other than they are a dispersed, lost tribe. So what's happening today is peoples are being uncovered and discovered. And we now have genealogy to understand names like Perez or Franco. And we can directly attribute that to 1492 and the expulsion of the Jews on the 9th of Av out of Spain. And where they went and where they settled. And how after 600 years we're beginning to find that their roots were completely embedded in the Jewish people, that they left Israel, went to Spain, not a big trip across the Mediterranean, not a big dispersion, but yet a dispersion, and then the migration from Spain into Central and South America. And we begin to see revival in Rosario, in Buenos Aires, all throughout South and Central America. There's revival going on in the Jewish people. And it's easy to understand how our people are going to come together with one heart and one voice. Because there are people that are holding on to a Shabbat observance, even though the people around them are stoning them, or setting their synagogues on fire, or stealing their Torahs, or defiling their holy books. This has been going on for thousands of years, and there's no outcry in the world. It was because of the world's silence and the world's really confusion that where you're taught the Ten Commandments in its entirety, well, 90% of it. And isn't it interesting that in the description of the commandments, the longest 
largest, most detailed, most explicit commandment of all, inclusive of who it applies to, where it applies to them, including man and beast, continuing into an explanation of a Shabbat year every seventh year and every 50th year for a jubilee. God declares the Shabbat extends all the way to the ground and to the harvest. Why do you think somebody would change it? Because the very identity of the nation of Israel is wrapped up in Shabbat. So you change Shabbat, you change the very cornerstone. You have monotheism merged with the Sabbath observance, and you have, what would you call that person? Jewish. So you want to rob the Jewish people of their identity, take away their language, take away their nation, take away their Bible, their Torah, and take away those things which are commanded. And you have an abrogated Ten Commandments. You don't have the Ten Commandments. So it gives you this explanation. Somebody asked me last night, a visitor, first-time visitor, they said, what would you consider to be the holiest day of the year in the Bible? And my answer was immediate, Shabbat. It's the only day that's instructed in the Ten Commandments. It's the only one that's repeated every week. It is the one God says to honor and obey and comply with, and here's the rules and regulations in which I want you to celebrate, and here's who it applies to. Now, the last time I checked, it's pretty inclusive. You're male or female slave. It doesn't say you're male or female Jewish slave. And it says the stranger in your settlements, that would be the alien living among you. This applies to all. Well, now that we're in the diaspora, we're dispersed. We're not in Jerusalem. We're not in Tel Aviv and, and uh, Joppa. We're not in Akko, and we're not in Haifa, and we're not in the settlements around Israel. Oh, but God doesn't say that. He actually says, or the stranger in your settlements, meaning wherever we go, wherever we exist, wherever we set up community, wherever we set up a kahila, a family, an entity, all those that come into that entity will observe it as well. That's why Messianic Judaism is what we are, because you come into this and you weigh into it, you're going to celebrate it this way. This is the prescription God wrote. This is the prescription we're going to take. And so we look at these first three commandments, and they are our relationship with God. We come across the fourth commandment, which merges our relationship with God with our relationship with each other, because I cannot possibly serve you if I'm not rested. Anybody gets too tired, what happens when you get too tired? You get irritable, right? Anybody here immune from irritability? Raise your hand. Okay, which one of you is completely immune from irritability? Anybody? No. We get tired, we get cranky, what happens? You can't serve one another in complete love. Things get tense, don't they? They get close. Okay, there's friction. Okay, we see that in the natural. God shows us in the natural things in the supernatural. Oh, you can rub for a while, that's okay. But you keep rubbing, 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 the hands get hot, don't they? Friction gets hot, doesn't it? It gets real hot. Pretty soon you've got to pull apart. Well, that's what we have to do with the world because there's friction with the world. God wants us to be set apart. He wants you to be in the world but not of the world. You have to find a way to get along but not to assimilate. And God says you will be set apart. This is how I will set you apart. How can you be set apart in God's economy? What did Messiah do? Did Messiah celebrate Sunday? No, he was a Sabbath observant Jewish man, Torah observant Jewish man. Therefore, if you're going to walk in the footsteps of Messiah, what are you going to do, go around him? Isn't your prayer that you never get ahead of God, right? That, you not be God, that God's not your co-pilot, that He's your pilot? Well, if you're going to follow in the footsteps of Messiah and go where He went and observe what He observed, He might have been somewhere preaching on a Sunday. I know I get a lot of engagements preaching on a Sunday. As a matter of fact, that's why we do it. Why do you think the Sabbath was established on Friday night and Saturday? So that I have another revenue stream for the congregation on Sunday. I think it's very logical makes sense. If every one of us was just in our own pulpits, I couldn't go out and get a special offering for the congregation on a Sunday teaching in some church somewhere. 
And this is the season, usually around Christmas or around Easter, that I get the most calls to come speak. You know, I've got a, uh, I'm going to be in Tuscaloosa on the, I think, uh, December 11th, teaching about the Jewish birth of the Messiah. They're in for a huge shock. <laughs> they have no idea. I said, are you sure you want, oh, yes, we want to know the Jewish perspective of the birth of the Messiah. Well, okay. Are you sure? Oh, yes, we really want this. Well, okay, you're going to get it. Got a hand up over here. Don't be angry at your pastor for not teaching you this. Right. I have three advanced degrees, two of them in history. I've never been taught any of this at state universities. So don't be frustrated with your pastor because basically seminary is garbage in, garbage out. Okay, whatever the professor says, is that's what you give them, whether you agree with it or not. And so don't be frustrated when you go back tomorrow morning in your Baptist churches, Methodist churches, whatever. Amen. Don't be frustrated with him. Just begin to pray and say, Lord, show him what you've showed me. And that takes time, guys. It does take time. Thank you for that. Because I want you to understand this building that's next door that's called the Messianic Jewish Learning Center. Our vision for that is that it be a place for pastors to come during the week and be taught. See, we've been called to a ministry of reconciliation. Now, what you're taught, I have these conversations with pastors, and there's a number of pastors in Birmingham that call for advice and counsel. How do I? And you don't turn a big ship on a dime. You don't. All right, how many of you are trying to turn a car and make a hard right turn at 80 miles an hour? It doesn't work too good, does it? Okay. Well, this is the path of 2,000 years. Right. And there's a change going on. And when we first came to Birmingham, and the first time I was in Birmingham five years ago was when we first came. And I had an opportunity to speak. There were just, I could count on one hand the pastors in Birmingham that were even receptive to talking to me. Last year at the Passover Seder, we had 78. Our goal is to have over 100 and to be have, able to have pulpit exchanges in Birmingham. You see, the denominations don't talk to each other. The only cross-denominational effort in Birmingham today, besides the Interfaith Council, which is leaders from all different denominations, the only one where they denominational clothing is the community Passover Seder, where everybody's the same. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter the color of your collar or the shape of your collar or the shape of your headdress. It doesn't matter. Because we are supposed to be amichad. We are supposed to be one people, one voice, one heart, one spirit, breaking down all the dividing walls. You see, we always refer to the temple, to the Mekitsa, to the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. Let me tell you, there's many more dividing walls within denominational Christianity than there is a division between Jew and Gentile. Many, many, many more. Ones, I mean, traps that, that are laid all over the place. They're like bear traps. You'll lose a, lose a leg in one of those traps. And some of them are violent, and some of them are passionate, and some of them are angry, and they don't even know what it's based on. So in this ministry of reconciliation, we have to understand what people don't understand, and we have to ease them into it gently. And you who go to a church on Sunday morning should be an ambassador not a rebeller. You should be one that shares truth in an appropriate manner. <coughs> and you're exactly right, Conrad. Exactly right. I mean, I've had, I've had conversations with people about replacement theology and God's covenant with His people, and they swear to you that God changed that. Swear to you. And I ask them for chapter and verse, and they say, but... but uh, uh, I know for a fact that because the Jewish people... I said, well, then Paul's a liar. Did they stumble so far as beyond recovery? No. It was a one-word answer, no. It wasn't, well, unless they changed their evil ways, baby. It says, no, they didn't. As a matter of fact, don't bite the hand that fed you. As a matter of fact, don't turn on the ones that paved the way. Their rejection brought you into salvation, brought you into an opportunity. But your opportunity is closing, and you better get it. And it's time to get it. 
Well, if we don't tell you and you don't tell somebody else and you don't share it, it's going to be a long time before Israel falls to their knees and cries out, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai. But if you do it with a ministry of love and reconciliation and bring the truth, it says you shall know the truth and what? The truth will set you free. Not your opinion, not this person's opinion, Joyce, or that person's opinion. The truth. There's only one truth. It's the Word of God. Give me chapter and verse position. And if you can't defend your position, back off. Kathy. Quick, uh, just a quick question. Um, the biggest argument I get from Baptist friends that I try to share some of the truth about uh, the holidays are is they go to Galatians and they twist some of that. Do you have a reference for Galatians or any teachings that y'all are doing here uh, where I could learn more about how to explain where, you know, where Paul says you don't judge based on of course you, you, don't, you don't Sabbath judge. You know, our, my, the teaching that I give is this. The Word of God says when two or more are gathered in the name of Yeshua, there he'll be in the midst of them. So Sunday worship, he's in the midst of them. I have no problem with Sunday worship. I have no problem with Easter. I have no problem with new moon or Sabbath observance or any of that. But to remember that the, the statement is, is that whether or not you, you uh, uh, it's the elimination. See, the whole concept of this is that it's fine to have Sunday worship. It's fine to have Tuesday. I mean, it, it doesn't say Tuesday. It doesn't say Monday. It just says, you know, don't criticize anybody for their Shabbat observance or, their, or, or whatever day it is. But to eliminate, and this was the elimination, the argument is, is this. You're not adding to or taking away from the Word of God by having Sunday worship. You're adding to or taking the Word of God away you're changing the Word of God when you establish Sunday worship and eliminate Shabbat. This is an alteration of the Word of God and then telling people that this is now the Sabbath. Calling it the Lord's Day, praise God. There ought to be a day of grace. I think it's wonderful to have a Shabbat day <clears throat> that ends your week of work and rest. And the very next morning, get up and go start the week with a day of grace in celebration of the grace that you have given to you, that this gift of salvation was given to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, and celebrating the grace given to you to have, have that. I would love to be able to worship three days in a row, Friday night, all day Saturday, and have somewhere to go on Sunday, come in here on Tuesday, go to a church on Wednesday, but to eliminate. That's the argument. You've taken something which was biblically mandated, eliminated it, and replaced it. You see, replacement theology isn't just replacing Israel with the church. Replacement theology is replacing Christian Christianity and replacing Judaism and replacing God's Word with man-made celebration. This is an ultimate replacement theology. And in this replacement theology, Congregation Bethel, and I'm not saying that they're, I don't look at them and say, you did this wrong. Your pastor didn't institute this. He's following and until there is a real clarity that comes to all at one time, and it's going to be a very top-down kind of thing, but they've gone so far, will they change? Well, change doesn't come 10 million people at a time. Change comes one person at a time. Why did Bethlehem start out in the, the uh, smelly upper room of Cathedral of the Cross okay, where they had, it smelled like tennis shoes? And now here we are in this beautiful place because it happened over time, one person, two people, five people, ten people at a time. Our prophecy in the news class started out with three people going to lunch. It's now around 100 people on a Tuesday. This class started out with 30 people in a choir room. All right, It's grown to 125 or whatever it is now. This is the way change takes place. People are hungry. They hear. It's the Breck commercial, and you tell two friends, and they tell two friends, and they tell two people. Right? Change happens this way. It doesn't happen by going to your pastor and saying, why your generational curse is going to your children and you're going to perish and you're going to be knocking on the door and he's going to say, depart from me. Why are you sorry? That, yeah, I'm not coming here. That's not going to work. Same way selling hell and damnation doesn't bring people into repentance, does it? It's this gentle application of the Word of God and sharing some things that excite you that you've learned and planting those seeds. How many of you have ever won an argument? <laughs> Nobody wins an argument, do they? What's the casualty of winning an argument? 
Oh, I won that argument. Yeah, you put that person down. They've been eviscerated. Maybe they'll recover. Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll be your friend. Maybe they won't. What's the fallout from winning an argument? That's, that's a casualty. A body count. How do you win an argument? You don't win an argument. When it gets to the point of an argument, it's a fight. Right? You can't win. You can't win at the exp- unless it's at the expense of somebody losing. And in God's economy, there should be no loser. God's economy calls for all of us to be winners. All of us have access to the victory. And if you're not a path for victory, you're a path for defeat. Yeshua said it very clearly. If you're not for me, actively for me, then you are against me. If you're not actively sowing seeds for a great harvest, then you're opposed to the harvest. You're an enemy of the harvest. And God wants you to take what you learn. And I give you this instruction on new members class. Take what you learn. If you're here for a season, learn it the biblical way. Notice I didn't say the right way or the wrong way. I'm not passing judgment on anybody. I'm telling you, I'm going to teach you what the Bible says. For most of you, for many of you, you've never heard what the Bible says. Nobody ever took the time to explain to you, this is what the Bible says. This is the original language. This is what these words mean. This is how to apply them contemporary. It was the Old Testament. Well, then Yeshua was the old Messiah because all he quoted from was the Old Testament. Well, when's the new Messiah coming that's going to bring us a new teaching? He's not. Either he was the Messiah or he wasn't, and what he taught you was from this book. And so in the context of that understanding and how to apply it to your life, this is the path to victory. This is not the path to defeat. And so in order to turn this, how is it going to happen? It's going to happen when this place has standing room only. When we have to build an addition or look for a bigger place because more people want the truth, they're more hungry for the truth, and then people say, oh, something must be happening there that's true. When it was 30 people, oh, well, you know, I think that's a cult. Let me assure you it's not a cult. In a cult, everybody does what the leader says, right? Yeah, then this is nothing like a cult. (laughs) But it becomes profound. And the newness of it is the oldness of it. And the freshness of it is the fact that we're not afraid to teach the Word of God. This is not a put-down. And I tell you, when you leave here, this is not a put-down. This isn't a criticism. This is an understanding. And when you understand it, then you have to make your own choice. No one's forcing you. We didn't force you to come here. We're like the, uh, on Tuesday mornings, when they come in on Tuesday, what do I tell them, Jim? The exits are here, clearly marked, and the exits are there. Nobody forced you to come, and nobody's going to stop you from leaving. The Word of God is true whether you like it or not, whether or not you were taught it, it's true. And understanding it and applying it is Shema. It's hearing the Word and obeying. This is the salvation plan. You can't hear the, the, the message of salvation and just hear it and not observe it, not obey it, not accept it. It has to be applied. In order for you to be a new creation, This has to take place and be active in your life. It's active listening. It's active receiving. Yes, Jim. In John chapter 16, Yeshua is explaining to his disciples that he's going to be leaving, that the Father is going to be sending the Holy Spirit. I want to read uh, in verse 23 of John chapter 16. When that day comes, you won't ask anything of me. Yes, indeed, I tell you that whatever you ask from the Father, He will give you in my name. Till now, you haven't asked asked for anything in my name. Keep asking, and you will receive, so that your joy may be complete. You know, it's, it's so clear that this plan of the Father is implemented for mankind. And these are the steps. If you want to get to the result, if you want to get to your destination, you'll follow the steps, right? And if you want to drive from here to Tuscaloosa, you know the steps to take, right? You get in your car, you go out here, you turn right. You get on the highway, you turn right, you get on this highway, you go. You don't have one step in that journey. You make a wrong turn. You don't get to your destination. God's telling you if you want to get to the destination, here's the steps to take. 
it will be a wonderful journey. Isn't it great that our people didn't follow this and He sent the Messiah so that our destination is secure? Because our destination is secure, what does God want to do for us now? He wants us to enjoy the journey. Here's the path for the most enjoyable journey you could ever have with the Lord. Not restrictive, freeing. You want to eliminate strife and anger and problems in your life, follow this. And you're going to eliminate the arguments and the agendas and the selfishness and the greed and the envy and the jealousy and the backbiting and the false witness and the murder and the stealing and all these things that go on that bring division to communities. And people are going to start to live in harmony. And what is harmony? Harmony is unity. What does God say? Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. He is the God of unity, and He's calling us to be Amechad, one people. Amen? Amen. All right, Lord, in the name of Yeshua.